Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm Steve Dickinson, director of the Poetry Center at San Francisco State University. And we're um, pleased to host today's special event. Our um, co-presenters, in addition to the Poetry Center, are the um, Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies, which is just down the hall from us at San Francisco State, and our friends Persis Karim and others, a stellar crew there. And also um, sponsoring today's event is, is um, the Diaspora Arts Connection and Nazi Kaviani. And um, hello to Nazi and thank you. And um, I want to begin with um, by saying that San Francisco State University um, uh, is situated on occupied land of the Ramatush Ohlone. And last week, the Poetry Center hosted um, David Swallow Jr., a, a Lakota Sundance chief and spiritual teacher. And, um, and we were contemplating, what does it mean, the land acknowledgement, to, to say that we're on, we are occupiers of a land that has not um, been, um, been given. And um, and we agreed that we needed to contemplate the, the notion of, of what does it mean to, to give the land back? What does it mean to think about that? So um, rather than just a, a kind of empty statement of goodwill or something, really, really um, setting something in our hearts that is different from the patterns that we've, um, we've been part of as um, settlers in this, in this place. 
And um, uh, today's event is in honor of this anthology, uh, a, a really gorgeous book, Essential Voices, Poetry of Iran and its Diaspora. It's from Green Linden Press. There is a, um, a link that will be available in the, um, in the uh, chat box so that you can order that book and that will probably be posted several times throughout the, um, the reading today and um it's edited by christopher nelson and uh, introduced by kave Bas basiri and this this wonderful painting on the cover is um is the work of golnaz fatih and um so i just wanted to make that acknowledgement um this is the first anthology of its kind that brings together poets of Iran and poets of the e extraordinary Iranian diaspora, which is planet wide. And there's work here translated from Swedish. I was just reading this morning and um, work translated from English from many languages. Um, and we're going to um, have uh, each poet will read um, for a short spell, poet or translator. Each poet will read um, some work by an Iranian poet as well as their own. Um, one of our poets present is, is, is here in the capacity as a translator and will be reading translations. And, um, and other, other poets are, also, are likewise translators. We're going to proceed um, alphabetically by surname. And so our, our first poet for today will be um, Armin Davudian and bring up Armin's biography. Um, Armin Davudian is the author of Swan Song, which won the 2020 Frost Place chapbook um, competition. His poems and translations from Persian appear in various places, including Anyi, the Yale Review. He grew up in Isfahan, Iran, and lives in California, where he's now a PhD candidate in, in English at Stanford. So please welcome Armin Davudian. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's good to be here. And uh, thank you, Persis, and everybody else at SF State for uh, organizing this reading, and to Christopher for putting the anthology together. I thought I'd, uh, I'm going to read two poems, uh, one by a, a, um, a poet in Iran in the anthology, whose name is Hassan Elizadeh. And the nice thing about this anthology has been um, one of the nice things has been how it's introduced me to all of these poets I didn't know before, and this is one of them. Um, so the poem is Good Faith by Hassan Elizadeh. And it spread its black wings, the snow. I was running, weeping, when suddenly beside the river, a small flower shimmering through glass like a golden spangle. And the wind, the wind was out of breath. Um, and then I will read one of my own poems called uh, Wake Up Call. I can see my mother apron over her nightgown, setting the table for breakfast a stack of lavash steaming at the center, honey and milk skin, feta with fruit, ch chickpea and chicken mash dusted with cinnamon. I can see my father already in his coveralls and cap, filling a cup to the brim with hot tap water and emptying it into another cup and emptying that cup into another until all three are warmed for tea. I can hear the kettle whistling and pull the covers tight around my head against the coming light. For any moment now, they will open the door and lift the covers and find that I'm not there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Armin. Um, that was beautiful. I, um, our next poet um, is, um, I have to do the um, 
here we are, Farnaz, Farnaz Fatami is a founding member of the Hive Poetry Collective, which produces podcasts and poetry related events in Santa Cruz County, so nearby. Her poems and lyric essays have um, recently appeared in many places. Um, and her book, Sister Tongue, won the 2021 Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize, selected by Tracy K. Smith, and it's forthcoming from Kent State University Press in fall 2020, fall 2022, this fall. So Farnaz Fatemi. Thank you. It's great to be here with such wonderful people and poets and translators. Um, like Armin, I'm going to read from... Uh, another poet in the book, and also somebody that I only discovered because of this book, Essential Voices. This is uh, Fereshte Sari. She lives in Tehran, and she also translates Russian. I'm going to read from the, po the poem untitled on page 234 of the book, if you have it. Of the house, the roof remained like an umbrella spread without purpose over a column of memories. Of the dragonfly, her antennas remained, searching for a sound. A whirlwind of dust and smoke was on the loose like the genie from the narrow bottle. Driftwood on the restless waters could have been a child's boat, and the flying papers, a blanket covering her light sleep. The onlooker did not find a name on the bulletin board. And that was translated by Paris Alcerange. This, this, I'm also gonna read a poem of my own from the book called Sister. And this was written about an experience of going back to Tehran, early 2000s. Sister, Merabad Airport, Tehran. Outside the terminal doors, we are a crushing pre-dawn crowd. We swarm out between the glass exits and the taxi stands. On one side, my grandmother, the other, my mother. My first visit since my grandfather's death years earlier. The sister disembarks, trails us by meters, is round, middle-aged, draped in black veils and skirts. She begins to scream in anguish, sags with the folds of cloth downward, drops to her knees, arcs her arms upward over her head, then down like two axes, down while she cries as if to pray and thresh the ground in punishment, pray and punish, pray and punish. She is wailing, my brother, my brother, the only one I had. I only had one brother, my brother. He was the only one I had. Strangers a dozen deep surround her, drawn by the keening of her loss. Her pitch rises as her body falls sideways. She leans there, the only one I had. A ring of women now wailing reach her. The sky above us swells with their sounds. We hover near the sister. My grandfather, my grandmother's face opens wide, cheeks flush, eyes pooling. My mother's face in answer, lips trembling, parted. My aunts, my sisters, my heart all flail open toward this crooning while my grandfather's memory takes shape between us sprung loose as if by incantation. He was the only one I had. Thank you, Farnaz. Our next reader is um, Gary Gock. And Gary is an American translator, author, editor, teacher, and poet. He lives on Russian Hill in San Francisco. His work has been translated also into several languages and has appeared in anthologies and periodicals. He serves on the International Advisory Panel of the Buddhist Channel, a Malaysian Buddhist news website, and he currently hosts Haiku Corner for Tricycle, the Buddhist Review. Gary Gok. Thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Persis. Thank you, Christopher. It is indeed an honor and a great delight to be here with all of these poets, translators uh, known to me and not known yet to me. We're all we're strangers, our friends we just haven't met yet. Um, <clears throat> I've translated um, and Christopher's published seven brief poems by uh, Ali Reza Roshan, which I've translated with Erfan Mojib, who lives in Iran. Ali Reza is now, in, he's from Iran and he's now in um, Hamburg. So first uh, we'll hear the poet reading two untitled brief poems and then I'll read the English. I'm going to um, stop that for the moment. And um, I, Gary, if we could rearrange so that we'll come back to that recording at the end of your reading, and I'll see if I can um, figure out another way to do it. In that time. How much night must I be for you to become the moon? You did to me what black mulberries do to fingertips. چقدر باید شب باشم تا تو ماه باشی تو با دل من همان کردی که شاتوت با سر انگشتان تو And um, thank you, Gary. Do you have anything else? Is that it? That's it. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you. And next we have um, Zara Hushmand. And just a moment. Zara Hushmand is an Iranian American writer whose work bridges cultural divides and includes poetry, theater, memoir, and literary translation. Her most recent book is Moon and Sun, Translations of Rumi's Rubaiyat. And um, I, I should say Iranian American writer. So thank you, Sara Hushmat. I'll read one of my own and one of um, an Iranian poet, uh, I'll start with, with one of my own, which I wrote for uh, an elderly couple that I met in Austin um, who were known to their friends as Mama and Baba. Mama and Baba. 
80 odd years of wandering, Armenia, Syria, Lebanon, Iran. The caravan has dumped them now a few blocks beyond Burnet. Baba rakes leaves on the front lawn while Mama stomps the growing pile in up to her knees, the pain for a moment forgotten as they laugh like young lovers in an old land with all the future of the wine still to come. And the next one is by Sohrab Seferi, who was one of the great Iranian writers of the 20th century and one of my favorite writers of anywhere in the world. Um, this is a poem called The Sound of an Encounter, which was translated uh, by Qasim Ali and Mohammed Jafar Mahalati. Basket in hand, I went to the market square. Early morning and the fruits are singing in the sun, spread out in banks, life dreams of eternal light, the shining perfection of rhymes. The orchard's long hours of worry glittered in the shadow of each fruit. Some unknown thing shone among the, among the quinces. The pomegranates spread their dark red across the country of the pious. Any thoughts I had about the people around me vanished before the gleaming ripeness of oranges. When I returned home, my mother asked, where is the fruit? How can this one little basket hold infinity, I asked. But I asked you to bring three kilos of good pomegranate. I tried, but the basket could not hold the immensity of even a single one. And the quinces, she demanded, what about our lunch? Oh, at noon, the image of a quince reflected back from the mirrors and stretched from now all the way to the end of time. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Um, our next poet um, is Persis Karim. And um, Persis is a poet editor and professor of comparative and world literature at San Francisco State University. Um, her poetry has been published in Reed Magazine, The Raven's Perch, The New York Times, and other publications. She's also the director of the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies at San Francisco State. So, Persis. Thank you, Steve. And I want to say especially a thank you to Christopher Nelson for this amazing work of putting this together. I don't know if you all know, he did it in less than two years, mostly during the pandemic. And that in itself is a feat. So thank you, Christopher, and thanks to all my fellow poet friends for today. Um, I'm gonna read, the first poem I'm gonna read is by Garus Abdulmalekian, who's um, a very, I, I think, well-known poet right now in Iran. And um, recently I saw his collection was published into English, which is exciting to see that contemporary poetry in Iran is actually getting a hearing in the English language. And this poem is called Border, and it's translated by Ahmed Nadalizadeh and Aydra Novi. Border. I am in repose as my wife reads a poem about war. The last thing I need is for the tanks to advance into my bed. Bullets have made numerous holes in my dreams. You put your eye up to one of them. You see a street, its skin whitened with snow. If only it did not snow, if the borders between the streets and the bed covers were clear. Now the tanks have crossed the trenches into our bed sheets, and one by one they enter my dream. I was a kid, my mother washed the dishes and my father returned home with his black mustache. When the bombs poured forth, all three of us were children. The following pictures of this dream will tighten your chest. Shut your eyes, put your lips on this little vent and just breathe, just breathe, 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 damn it, just breathe, breathe. The doctor shakes his head, the nurse shakes her head. The doctor wipes the sweat from his brow and the green mountain chain on the screen turns to desert. 
And then this is a poem I wrote in the days after uh, the January 6th insurrection on our capital, and it's called The Two Mariams, January 2021. Sometimes we talk, mostly we don't. The weight of our different lives wears like a shadow over us. The sanctions are killing us, she wrote once last year. We send messages over WhatsApp that say something more, a photograph of a bird or the pomegranate I cut in half, her cat Mishu or my dog Maya. These days we speak about rulers and regimes without saying the words. She knows I understand this too. When the pandemic erupted, we spoke more often. We stay inside. I only see my husband and mother, she writes, when Iran is second or third in the world in cases and deaths. Last week, she sent a message in lowercase letters. I am sorry for your country. We met once in Paris when she tried to get a visa to visit our sick and elderly uncle Masoud in California. I jumped on a plane to France, spent a week roaming the city with her before the appointment at the embassy. She loved the cellist in the subway and the women smoking in cafes. Iran is full of darkness, she said. I did not know if she meant her country or the prison cell where she spent her youth after the revolution. I was too afraid to ask. We drank wine and coffee and found our father's childhood home where they lived during the First World War and hid in the basement from the bombs. Our Baba Bazorg had set up a Persian textile business in the 16th arrondissement before the war forced them to return to Iran. She never got the visa, even with her American born cousin standing beside her at the counter. They didn't deny her exactly. They didn't even look at her papers. The woman behind the glass separation said, you people, when I asked for an explanation. That was 1993 before 9-11, before the axis of evil, before the Iran nuclear deal, before the Muslim ban, before our fathers died. We are both named after our grandmother, Maryam, whom I had never met. We are close but far away, cousins in two continents, dancing on the tightrope of a history that pushes forever at the seams of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Persis. Um, our next poet is um, Mo Mojde Marashi, a designer, artist, writer, and translator. Mojde was born in Tehran, Iran, and moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in 1977. She now lives and works in Palo Alto, where she works as managing director at Blurred Whisper an idea and design studio in Palo Alto, where, which um, she co-founded in 2002. Mojde studied art at California College of Arts, where I was on the picket line yesterday, and uh, later at San Francisco State University, where she earned her Master of Arts interdisciplinary, um, in, in, Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Arts, and a second MA in Creative Writing, Mojde Marashi. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us, um, who, the people who are joining us as guests. And uh, thank you, um, people who actually uh, made this possible. Um, I, um, I wanted to um, read you a poem from um, uh, a very, very prominent um, poet, um, Hushang Ebtehaj, um, who does not need any introduction. Um, I did put in the, um, the uh, Wikipedia's uh, page on him in case that's uh, interesting to you. Um, I Before I start, I just want to say when we um, started this journey to do a book of uh, translation from Saya's poetry, um, this is many years ago, um, uh, my co-translator, Chad Sweeney and I, who met at San Francisco State, um, fell in love with his poetry. And at that time, I couldn't share any English translation of uh, Saya's poetry with him because there were none. So we decided to uh, embark on a journey that 
we had no idea was so difficult, but I am um, really happy um, that we did this and we made um, the first translations possible. Um, so, um, and I'm actually even happier than there are other translations now. Um, some of them appear in the book um, and, uh, you know, hopefully you get a chance to read them all. Um, <clears throat> this one is actually a ghazal. Um, I will read the Farsi version after uh, the Persian version after the um, English. Exiled. Tehran, summer 1987. Search, search the house. Look everywhere. You're an exile in this house. Search like an exile. One is a meadow lark, my own heart's pair. The word is not her nest, search for the nest. One is a wine maid, tipsy behind a curtain. She passed on the glass, so whirl like the drunks. The joy of darkness hides under whose lips? From this hand to that, like a shared glass circle. One is a starling that ate the garden of my heart. You won't find her in a trap. Search for the seeds. A wind from her mouth has caught me in fragrance. She's here, she's here. Search the whole house. A song no one heard. It fled from itself. Don't call out his name. Go softly, go softly. Tears planted in that dirt grow the root of the wine. In the turbulence of wine, churn in the cellar. What a sweet smell. Where's her bed? Circle that flower as a butterfly search. Laugh at the intellect that love didn't choose it. Swing in this chain like a lunatic search. Her footprints not here in these walls built of sorrow. If you hunger for treasure, search in the ruins. If a door opens inward, you are the key. Turn like the gears in a lock made of time. Who wailed her face from Saya under a spell of sleep? In dreams, you can't find her, search in legends. Her body brushed my body. She took me, she took me. If she never brings me back, go with gratitude, whirling. And now the Farsi version. Garibane. Begardid, begardid. Darin khane begardid. Darin khane garibid, garibane begardid. یکی مرغ چمن بود که جفت دل من بود جهان لانه او نیست پی لانه بگردید یکی ساقی مست است پس پرده نشسته است قده پیش فرستاد که مستانه بگردید یکی لذت مستی است نهان زیر لب کیست از این دست بدان دست چو پیمانه بگردید یکی مرغ قریب است که باغ دل من خورد به دامش نتوان یافت پی دانه بگردید نسیم نفس دوست به من خورد و چه خوش بوست همین جاست همین جاست همه خانه بگردید نوایی نشنیده است که از خیش رمیده است به قوغاش مخانید خموشانه بگردید سرشکی که بر آن خاک فشاندیم بنه تاک در این جوش شراب است به خونخانه بگردید چه شیرین و چه خوش بوست کجا خوابگه اوست پی آنگل پرنوش چو پروانه بگردید بر آن عقل بخندید که عشقش نپسندید 
در این حلقه زنجیر چو دیوانه بگردید در این کنج قماباد نشانش نتوان یافت اگر طالب گنجید به ویرانه بگردید کلید در امید اگر هست شمایید در این قفل کهن سنگ چو دندانه بگردید رخ از سایه نهفته است به افسون که خفته است به خوابش نتواندید به افسانه بگردید تن او به تنم خورد مرا برد مرا برد گرم باز نیاورد به شکرانه بگردید Thank you I'm going to stop because I think I took more than enough time Oh, that was very beautiful, Mojde. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and our, our next poet is Sholay Wolpe. And Sholay is um, award-winning poet, artist, and literary translator, born in Iran and grew up in Trinidad and the UK before settling in the United States. She earned an M MA in radio, television, and film from Northwestern University, as well as a Master of Health Sciences degree from Johns Hopkins University. Wolpe is the author of the chapbook, The, Out the Outsider, um, a new collection of poetry called Abacus of Loss, and several other books, in, including a, a prominent translation of Farouk Farouk which we were fortunate to um, help um, co-host an event uh, a year ago around the work of Farouk Farouk Saad. So, Sholay Volpe. Hi. Uh, so that, that uh, Persian poem just, just took my breath away. Thank you, Mushte. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I will begin by uh, reading um, a poem by Nader Naderpur, who uh, a very prominent uh, Iranian poet was nominated for the um, uh, Nobel uh, Prize, but she, uh, he, um, he died in the uh, year 2000. This was translated by myself and Sahba Shoyani. Ghazal II, ancient motherland, land of my beloved. I tore my heart away from you, but if I flee to where must I flee? And if I stay, where can I stay? I have neither the legs for leaving nor the strength to remain. I am like a barren tree, and it would not be strange if the axe-wielding cutter covets my bones. How can a celestial flower bloom and release its perfume in this hell? Spring, what will I gain from your reign when I am the essence of fall? So many beautiful uh, poems in this anthology. I'd like to thank uh, Christopher Nelson for putting it all together. Um, okay, I am going to read uh, my poem in the anthology. So this poem is uh, from Abacus of Loss, which is a memoir in verse, but it is, um, it is an unusual form. This is a whole chapter called This Coffin. And um, every chapter in the book is divided by beads. So it's got bead section, bead one, bead two, bead three, etc. However, and then um, it is prose and poetry. Prose is the story, the outer layer, and the poetry is the inner state. So because you cannot see the poem, um, when I'm reading the prose, I guess I will have my red shawl. And when I'm reading the poetry, I won't have it. Okay. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I've cut parts of it out. I lie on my old spring bed, 
thinking about girls who slit their wrists, who pour kerosene on their heads and light a match. I'll be 13 soon. We kiss the warm earth lips drawing moans from the sea. Like ghosts in flimsy shrouds, fountains of semen recreate us, sinew by shadow, by flesh, and this coffin, mine. Mama's cousin is soon to be married. She's visiting from her village and they've installed her in my room. I ask about her fiance. She says, you're too young for that talk. Every night she shoves my doll into my arms and kisses me goodnight. Who takes comfort from sleeping with a stiff metal made plastic body? If I tell her this, her eyelashes will blink away my words. I clutch the doll and say good night. The house is corpses of women, cooking meal after meal. The house is my voice trapped beneath blue, blue bed sheets. It is a child in a rooftop watching stars, those scorching bodiless heads shoot across night sky. My country stands behind a tree laden with fruit yet hungry. Instead of seeds, it plants landmines in the fertile soil, arranges vowels along its windowsills like shells from an oil-ridden shore. I carry my coffin on my back. In Trinidad, my aunt takes care of me. My grandmother cooks and gives plenty of advice. I get fat, I get lost. My skin isn't dark enough, it isn't white enough. My hair doesn't curl tight, nor does it drop like a waterfall. I wish I could iron my tongue, crease it sharp so I could belong. Women sing absence like opera. They sprinkle it on white sheets like perfume, grafted to trees like branches from homeland, indelible sacrifications on their lips. The dance is this late breeze, swings the hangman's robe, cold fingers through my hair. Daddy sends me to an all girls boarding school in England. My roommate has long blonde hair. She mocks the dark hair above my lips. I buy tweezers. Mother's cousin calls, says, the Basij have come knocking on our door looking for her husband. He ran out the back door, thank God. But they would not leave empty handed. They went next door and arrested our pregnant Baha'i neighbor. I want my Mattel doll back. I want it shoved into my arms. I promise not to eavesdrop. Refugees trail the narrow roads like sheep wandering edges of hallucination. They have no names and their throats are foggy with mournful songs. They are the dead who smell of bone ash. They carry their coffins on their backs and the bones in their eyes ache. Think of those left behind, he says, the young girls they just hanged for refusing to convert. A good religious girl, I'm on display under a bell jar. No boyfriends, no late night parties, no drinking. In the United States of America, all daddy cares about is to protect my virginity. He guards it like his wallet. Don't wish for death. It may hear you and come dressed like a clown. Don't wear your scars like notes scribbled on the margins of books. Don't line your shoes along the cold wings of a plane about to take off. Fear licks my living skin like a lynx. I walk with a coffin on my back. To escape daddy's rules, I get married. 
he is relieved. It's exhausting to protect a girl in a place like America. He holds his head between his palms when mama reminds him of what we have lost. The losing never stops. It's just not just things, family, neighbors, people we have known all our lives. Dr. So-and-so is now a dishwasher in a diner in DC. The engineer who built such and such bridge lays tiles in rich people's home in LA. My school principal and his wife, well, they just disappeared. Tonight, I lose the way to my next dream. Like a candle in a paper boat, daddy offers me to the sea. I chant every prayer I know, but no mermaid takes pity and returns me to my childhood. My songs will not wake the moon's face, the house grass, snow, donkeys burdened with almonds. Instead, the sound of knives sharpens against darkness. Instead, my blouse aches from this cold, contagious absence. Um, well, thank you. If you want to read the rest of it, you have to get the anthology. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Cholet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like um, all the poets now to, to turn on their cameras if they're not on. And um, we're going to also bring Christopher Nelson, editor of the anthology forward. And the anthology we're talking about again, if you joined us late, is, is Essential Voices, Poetry of Iran and its Diaspora. It's from Greenland and Press. And it's a 360 odd page anthology of um, work in from multiple languages into English and work originally written in English. And um, I'm encouraging the audience to bring questions. I see we have an audience of about 60 people. So I'd, I'd like um, people to bring questions into the um, Q and A box at screen bottom, questions for any of the poets. But I want to open with a question for Christopher and just so um, to welcome him here. And um, when when Mojde was was speaking, um, she remarked that um, this hers was a new translation, a first translation. And I'm thinking that um, as we work in English, this imperial language, that, which is so hostile to, to um, translation, um, the, um, by that I mean um, the United States has fewer works published in translation than just about anywhere in the world. And, um, and small publishers have really gone against that, that tendency for many years. And, and so I'm wondering about just... Um, how much of this work was was newly translated for the anthology and, and 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 available to those of us who are monolingual in English for the first time? Yeah, it's a great question, Steve. Thank you, um, and thanks for inviting me to be part of part of the Q and A here. Um, most of the poems in translation in the anthology were translated prior to the anthology project. Some of, some of them were translated just for the anthology. Um, and, you know, there's, there's sort of lots of logistical reasons for, for that. Uh, um, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to, to do the book, you were, your, your question suggests this, is that, you know, a lot of these these poets are not easy to find in English, and my intention is to to um, you know bring these wonderful poets to a wider audience. Um, some of the poets um, have have only been translated sort of scantily, as far as I could tell, you know, um, and um, I was very happy that we could, um, I did commission some translations. Um, Mansur Auji passed away during the making of the book. 
and some of the translations in there, for example, um, were done just for the for the book. Thank you, thank you. Um, again, I'm asking the audience to put any questions you have in the in the Q and A box at the bottom, and then we can um, we can voice them and. Um, and I'm wondering, um, amongst the um, the poets present here, um, what questions do you have for one another? Um, I don't really have a question for anyone in particular, but I guess it's a comment and also a question for everyone um, in terms of thinking a little bit about the resonance between poets in Iran, dead and alive, dead and living, sorry. Um, uh, and the diaspora, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about what a long trajectory poetry has in, in this culture um, and, and how it is communicated through many of us who are not born and raised with the Persian language. Um, and I wonder if any of you want to say anything about that idea of poetry that's assembled to kind of echo both the present in this diaspora context versus in the Ir Iranian and Persian language context. And I'm I'm going to point to Armin because he's probably more, most recently come from Iran of everyone. Hi, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking, um, I don't know, I think, I mean, to be completely honest until the sort of uh, making of this anthology, I hadn't thought of, um, I hadn't thought of myself as being in a community of writers, like writing across all of these <laughs> countries in two or more languages. I mean, there are, um... so I feel like for me, it, it really was, um... I don't know, like the, 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 like being part of, part of a sort of a diasporic poetry community has been coextensive with this anthology itself. I mean, before that I had like, I. I translated uh, poets from Iran, but um, I don't know. I feel like this was a kind of awakening for me as well, but I, th I think others <laughs> may have been already, uh, may have already have taken the pill before. So. Yeah, I'll just say something, uh, not necessarily addressing that, but um... I think it's just wonderful to see another anthology added to the body of literature of the world that comes from Iran, but I think just about any, any um, presentation of poetry from a country that's most of the time misunderstood or its people are misunderstood or at least looked at uh, through the eyes of politics. So always, always literature bridges the gap between cultures and people. And so to have one more anthology to be another brick or another whatever bridges are made of uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the body of that bridge is, is very important. And so I hope I'm, um, I mean, years ago I did The Forbidden and that was many, many years ago. I'm so grateful there is a new anthology, um, you know, bringing more poets uh, together. And I hope in, I don't know, five or six years, we see yet another anthology and that it just continues um, because it is being done by, um, by other, uh, poets of other countries of Arab nations. So it's just it's just great to see Iranian poetry, a country that's so rich in poetry, um, to be part of the body of literature in English language.
other poets um, within the anthology, Zara perhaps, um, you would have, um, uh, could speak to this, this notion of, of, of the, perhaps the impact of this anthology. And, and... Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I think I, I may have a longer view than, than many people here because um, I am of, I'm of an older generation in terms of the, uh, um, the mixed Iranian American. Um, I think my father was one of the very few students that came out bef um, right after World War II. And I was born here in, in the 50s. And so I have watched, and I, I went back to Iran and lived there when I was younger, but um, I've watched a whole generation growing up when it was very, very hard to find any translations available in the very early days. And um, I was translating, but without a lot of background and without a lot of context. And I think one of the important early anthologies was the one that, that Persis Karim did. Um, and that was really the beginning of a sense of a diaspora community. Um, I think, again, in, in the long view, one of the things that's been really important to me is to understand how important poetry is in Iranian culture compared to American culture. And um, it was very much to be, to find myself part of a, a larger, deeper, more ancient um, poetic tradition. And in some ways it doesn't, uh, there's almost no comparison. There's no balance because I, I was born speak into an English speaking environment and I studied English literature at London University um, and English was my first language and, and my drug of choice as I describe it in places. Um, but somehow to find myself as an Iranian writer was to be elevated beyond my wildest dreams. And um, so that sense of diaspora community, uh, it's like the English translations, um, they're wonderful and they open a door and they make it possible to begin to imagine. Um, but there's something going on in the, in the Persian and the Farsi that is, um, we can only dream of aspiring to this. <laughs> and I, I don't want to, I don't want to dampen this um, because every effort, and I think what Christopher has done is, is to, to mix the, um, the Iranian poets and the diaspora poets uh, is, is a brave and important step. And I think we, but we, we need to recognize that this, there's something coming from Iran that um, really needs to be honored. And it's, it's beyond what it's possible to express in translation. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. And, and one of the questions from um, a guest, Shelley Holder, um, it, it perhaps is pointed to from, from what you just said. Um, are there any comments that people have on the relationship that diaspora poets have either towards or away from classical Persian poetic forms? And I don't know if, if somebody would like to address that. Mojde is, 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 is um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of wondering if I should even try. Um, it's, uh, it's probably some, uh, something that, because I was going to say something uh, in regards of uh, what Zara was saying, um, and it may or may not, uh, you know, um, actually be related to this question, but I'll try to address as much as I can. I just wanted to say, um, Zora, thank you for bringing that up. The, the, the Persian culture is, I would say like poetry is just, I don't know, it's like inseparable, you know, you cannot separate uh, Persian culture to poetry. Just about all of all, the proverbs and saying in um, in um, in Persian is actually a line of poetry. So it's kind of difficult to separate. Um, you know, just like poetry for us is very very different. And I I came here when I was um, nineteen, but 
I, I should say that my one of my first games that I played with my parents was a game called Moshoire, in uh, which is basically just reciting poetry back and forth. I, you know, I, uh, I recite a line and then uh, whatever sound that, um, you know, that line ends with, you're supposed to match it and um, start a, a line of po um, poem that starts with that um, that sound. So, you know, from a young age, that's what we kind of were around. Poetry was just, uh, and, and, and it's, you know, I mean, I'm not a historian and, you know, I'm not a, a scholar, but what I, in my own kind of thinking, I'm thinking this is very natural when you can, when you cannot say a lot of things, when it is um, difficult, then you kind of say it with poetry because it's so much easier to say things and, uh, you know, in poetry. Um, and I just wanted to um, talk about, because we did actually, um, you know, to address that question, um, the, 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 po the poem that um, I read was actually the Ghazal. Um, Saya, um, you know, not only um, writes the new poem as it's called, uh, no, but also um, is a prominent, um, you know, um, poet when it comes to writing Ghazal. In fact, he, he's called uh, the modern Hafez. Um, and um, I can just tell you that it, it, it was, very, very difficult to, to, to do, uh, you know, any of those um, poems, to translate any of those poems, because there are so many references, so many references, as, um, as Zara uh, mentioned, it's so deep in the history and culture that one word may mean so many things. The, the, the one that I read, uh, for ex the one that I um, read, for example, has like the word search, but in Varsi search has three or four five different, four different meanings. So it's very difficult. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but I just wanted to kind of like stress the importance um, of uh, poetry in, in Iran. Uh, I want to say something to that as well, taking, looking at it from another perspective, because I'm a, I'm a poet who translates. I'm not a translator, you know, I'm the other way around. I'm a poet who translates. So for me, writing poet as a poet of diaspora, the Iranian music, the musicality of the ancient poetry is always in my head and it influences me. So when I um, translated uh, at Tars, the Conference of the Birds, so I did, I, did, I did the opposite. What I did is I took the form and I transformed it into modern uh, poetry in English. But but the musicality is there because the music of the language is in my head. Um, and I did the same when I translated Farouk uh poet, the ones that are in form uh, into English. The musicality is there, but the form is not there. So it's it's something that we do as poet translators in English. Some of us, at least I do. One of the questions that occurs in the um, Q and A box um, turns not, not not so much to formal issues, but to to um, um, this. Mani Farhadi says today's theme is about diaspora and being far from our homeland. Um, doesn't that longing for the land we're from create a space for these poems of longing? Would our poetry be as powerful if we were not in diaspora? Farnaz, are you, do you think you might want to respond to that? I'm not sure what I would say about that. Um, <laughs> I am, I, I mean, I think there's a danger in sort of homogenizing the diaspora, even. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I grew up in a house that spoke that I heard Farsi and English both. And that the, my connection is more to the language than the place. Um, and so that's complicated. And the next Iranian American over is going to have a different experience. Um, so there's longing for sure, but I think that's the nature of um, making poems is a, a, an, a 
an attempt to translate our world, um, my world. Um, and I think that we are all, I mean, whatever culture we're naming, I think when we come to poetry, we're looking for that kind of translation, that kind of expression. So that's that's what I think of when I, I mean, that's longing is certainly a part of making poems. It's not the only thing, but it's part of who I am as a poet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Persis. I, yeah, am I muted? Okay. I just wanna add something to Manny's question that is that some of, I think what also draws us to poetry is that it it does have this power in Iranian culture to, that, you know, I grew up in an English speaking household, but my father regularly recited Omar Khayyam. He regularly talked about poetry as and proverbs. Like he would tell me a Persian proverb proverb, he would say it in Persian, but he would always translate it into English. So I was very struck by the playfulness and the music and the poeticness of this language, which I had absolutely no access to because he didn't speak. So I think it kind of um, hints at what Shole was talking about is that there's something extremely powerful. It's a, it's a kind of when people ask about what is the essence of Iranian culture, without question, lots of people will point to poetry as being sort of a hallmark of what you can say is something that is communicated through time from the Iranian context, even at least in my experience, at least in a, in a way in which my father was connected to it as a, an immigrant who didn't regularly go back there. And I think that idea of, you know, it's been recognized that in the Iranian culture, poetry has had such a strong and resonant um, importance over a long period of history. Um, so even if you look at Zara Hushman's recent translation of Rumi, um, she's making something that's very difficult to translate accessible in English. And we lose something in the translation, but it's still very powerful even in the translation. And I think that causes us to long to be connected, to me anyway, to be connected to something that has such a powerful hold on people. Thanks, Persis. Um, here's a question for Christopher um, regarding criteria for the anthology. Were there any um, gender-based or motif-based criteria? Criteria were you looking for sim similarity or diversity? Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I'll maybe say at the beginning of of, of addressing a complicated uh, topic is that I'm happy with the range of the book and it is, it's larger than I initially set out to do. There's 130 poets and translators involved in the project. And um, honestly, I wouldn't have aimed for that at the beginning, that, that would have seemed like too much to take on. But, um, you know, when one gets assembling uh, or curating, I like to think of it as curating a book like this, um, one realizes that, uh, you know, it, it could be bigger even, <laughs> right? There's there's a vastness to draw from and that's, that's exciting. That's really exciting. Um, but of course, it, there has to be constraint too. And so pretty early on, I decided it would be living poets exclusively um, to, you know, because Cholet and Persis and others have done some wonderful work over the past couple of decades to bring um, into English, uh, a lot of the a lot of the great writers from the 20th century, but uh, at a certain point, I, I, I it wasn't tenable to exclude some of the giants of the 20th century, um, Farouk and Shemlu, for example, and so uh, there's about 10 in there who their their influence and the gravity of their their work is just so immense that. I felt they had to be in there. Um, but the emphasis is certainly on uh, 
uh, you know, the contemporary. Uh, I tried to make it as much about what's happening now, make it recent. Um, I love that we heard one of Garus Abdelmalekian's poems, um, that, that translation uh, in English, I, I believe it came out, was it a year, maybe uh, two years at the most. So, you know, this is, and that's when I was working on the book, I had the, the galleys of Garus's book so it sort of was happening in parallel. Um, but uh, there's 10 languages that, that were, tra were translated from into English. So I did want a diversity, linguistic diversity as, as well. And um, I did want a gender balance as, as much as one can. Um, uh, I wanted some queer poets in there and I'm happy to say they're, they're well represented. It is, it is a dangerous thing to be an openly queer poet in Iran. And um, so, yeah, I, I hope that that sort of gets at some of the concerns I had when, when, um, when making decisions. We, we also had an open reading period um, where, you know, people were sending work that was unsolicited. And some of the poems from the open reading period are in the anthology. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, Mohammed Tavakoli is asking, um, I'm interested in the surging interest in poetry. Is poetry a post-ideological and individuated medium of communicating the global experience of Iranianness? So I guess um, that question is kind of getting at, you know, what what an elusive quality, the gl global experience of being I Iranian um, and a notion that somehow poetry transcends various ideologies. I don't know. Um, anybody want to um, respond to that? I'll respond to that. Thank you, Mohammed John, for that uh, wonderful question. Well, uh, poetry is the soul. I mean, soul of any culture, any nation. So it, I think it goes, as you very well know, I think, uh, it's, it's beyond uh, ideology, although it contains ideology. It's beyond... Um, beyond uh, taking sides, yes, it takes sides. I mean, it's, it's, it's so many things. And I think, um, yes, uh, it, it, our Iranian-ness, what we show of our Iranian-ness in poetry is our soul. And I think that's really, really important. That's why poetry matters, because we see the soul of a nation or we see a soul of a culture. I mean, I guess I was trying to suggest something also about the, you know, the power of poetry in um, the Iranian context is that people often recite poetry from Hafez or Rumi, and they, you know, older generations, I mean, Mojde spoke to it, right, the game of reciting poetry. So there's something powerful about that being communicated across time, across uh, generations, and across geographic limitations. Um, and, you know, as people know, uh, translations, for example, of Rumi by Coleman Barks were popularized. I, I don't remember what the statistic is, but he was the most popular poet at one point in America. And here he is a a poet in the Persian language. And um, that says something about the message also of how, I mean, he, that's even with a translation of somebody who's not versed in the language. So there's probably something about the, you know, the musicality, the messaging. Um, and, and to your point, Mohammed, about post ideological, I think also, um, if we think about poetry in the Iranian context, um, it's been used for ideological purposes, and it's also been used to poke fun at 
ideologues and ideological messaging. And so I think that's what's so powerful about it is it doesn't, it doesn't fit in a nice neat box at all. Um, and I think even if we think about Iran's modern history, people were very effective at using metaphor and um, allegory to subvert uh, you know, ideological positions, uh, both in poetry and fiction. And so I think that's part of the cleverness and the opportunity that's presented in poetry as a genre, but also perhaps in the Persian language, some of the indirection of Persian is probably effective for those kinds of things to subvert ideological positions and um, properties. Yeah, it, it, it occurs to me, Persis, as you're saying that, that um, what you're calling the, the, the indirectness and so forth, um, the oblique nature perhaps of the language, um, it, it seems to me also can come through in, in, in that proliferation of Iranian films, you know, that, that have had an international audience and have been able to um, be made, you know, under situations of censor censorship and so forth. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I have to say something before, uh, I know I'm probably talking too much here, but um, I think we also have to understand that not all poets speak freely and not all poetry comes completely from the soul. And the reason I say that is because in certain countries, Iran included, um, there is a there is there are poets that who are raised within an ideal with a certain uh, confined ideological space and they don't necessarily represent the spirit of poetry of Iran and I think that's really really important to say and to distinguish between poets who are free and poets who've been raised within a certain ideological environment. Okay, so that, that's really important to say. And then I also see that someone has said that uh, the poets of diaspora seem to, to get to have been stuck in longing. I completely disagree. Probably it started at a certain point. I'm a poet of diaspora. My, my own poetry is not poetry of longing. I may speak of memory. I may speak of fitting in or not fitting in or, or perceiving the world from a specific angle, but it certainly is not uh, poetry of longing. Sarah? Yeah, if I could just add something to that. Um, one of the things I think that uh, this anthology does is um, not be bound by some of those stereotypical ideas about what diaspora is. Part of the um, the challenge is, you know, one writes many, many poems and editors will choose the ones that fit with what they think, uh, you know, a diasporic poem should be. Um, and, you know, you are, you are a refugee, you are an exile, and, you know, maybe you're not, but the, the other ordinary poems that you write are less likely to get a reading um, because there's assumptions about what, you know, a, an Iranian American should be writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Armin, you look like you have something on your mind. Oops. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, none of us have achieved the Zen state of not having things in our mind. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking about this. I, I, I just feel like it's, it's sort of impossible for, for poetry to not be ideological. Um, and I mean, even to speak of the soul is already to like implicate oneself into an ideology. So I don't know, I'm just thinking about it. And then, but I also, I, I also just feel like poetry is morally neutral and not like, there are works of art I admire written by sort of people with ideologies which are abhorrent to me. So I, I was just turning those things in my head. Mm -hmm. That's not very helpful, but yeah. 
I guess in that sense, it transcends ideology in that you can appreciate. It's hard to read an essay and like it if you don't agree with its argument, but I feel like I, I mean, there are poems I, lo I like that are frankly racist or are not like, it's just, it, it seems like there is something other than the, the subject matter that, that draws you and that can be both volatile and dangerous, but also is maybe what distinguishes the art form. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I did note um, we're, we're getting um, near out of time and, and um, it's 4 a.m. in Iran and, and it, we're grateful to have people here from that distance. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I noted that um, Essential Voices is said to be a series. So this seems like Christopher has a plan to um, work um, on, on yet another anthology and perhaps projected others. So could you maybe address that a little bit, Chris? Yeah, thank you for asking, Steve. Yes, that's the, that's the plan. That, and Essential Voices, Poetry of Iran and its Diaspora is the first. Um, we have just begun work on the second in the Essential Voices series. Um, it will be Essential Queer Voices of U.S. Poetry. And um, so probably two years. It's hard to project exactly, but yeah, we've just begun working on that. And, you know, I, I, I hope one can, one can have um, grand visions for the future, right? Maybe this, maybe this will be, there'll be many books and more and more people will get involved. And, um, uh, you know, there's lots of books that I would like to make and lots of books that poets and translators have expressed interest in, in sort of exploring different um, languages or geographies or, um, uh, you know, cultural circumstances. So, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the interest. And um, like I said, the second one is underway. There's information on it at greenlandandpress.com. Great. Um, is there anything else from our poets who are here that you'd like to add before we leave? Okay, well, um, we all thank the audience. We've had a, a fantastic audience of around 60 people here, um, obviously from many places in the world and which is totally appropriate. And, and one of the reasons why this medium worked well for today I'm, I'm grateful for everyone being here together today and taking the time during the afternoon on a beautiful um, Saturday afternoon. And um, please um, reach out to um, find the work by these writers and, um, and find the work in this anthology. You know, it, it, uh, again, that's Greenland and Press. And so grateful to everyone. Um, we'll be signing off. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.